In this video, I will be showing the chemistry behind this year's Nobel Prize, which is click chemistry. Two of the Nobel Prize winners independently developed the click reaction. In this reaction, an alkyne and an azide react under the influence of a copper catalyst to form a 1,4-di-substituted triazole. The reason it is called click chemistry is because this reaction happens at room temperature, in air and at high yields. So it is basically as simple as clicking two molecules together. The reaction is especially interesting for the development of pharmaceuticals and new materials. So let's see how the reaction works in practice. Before I start the click reaction, I will prepare an organic azide to do the reaction with. So I set up a stir plate and a dish and make an ice bath. When the ice bath is set up, I submerge a 100ml flask into it. Now I add 2 grams of tosyl chloride to the flask. I drop in a stir bar and then add 20 ml of acetone and 10 ml of water. I let it stir for a bit and then add 1.3 grams of sodium azide. Now that everything has been added, I leave it to stir for 4 hours and allow it to come back to room temperature. In this reaction, the chlorine from the tosyl chloride is simply replaced by the azide group from sodium azide to form tosyl azide and sodium chloride. When I come back, all the ice is gone and the reaction should be finished. Now I will boil off all of the acetone. So I set the flask in a heating mantle and attach a gas adapter and heat it to 30 C. I pull a vacuum and simply let the acetone go through the pump. After a while, all of the acetone is gone and only some water vapors are condensing in the flask. So I remove the vacuum and take it off heat. Now the mixture has separated into two layers. I move it all to a separatory funnel and we can see the product sitting on the bottom. It still needs to be washed, so it can't simply be drained off. First, I add about 30 ml of diethyl ether to take up the product. Since it is less dense than water, it won't take up the product yet and I need to shake the funnel to bring them into contact. Now that the product is dissolved in the top ether layer, I can separate the layers. I pour the water layer back in and extract it once more with some ether. I drain away the water layer and then pour the previous ether layer back into the subfunnel. Now I wash the ether layer with water and a 5% sodium carbonate solution. When that is done, I dry the ether layer with some anhydrous sodium sulfate. I filter the mixture through some cotton and then move the flask with the filter to a heating mantle with a gas adapter. Like before, I heat the mixture lightly and pull a vacuum to remove all of the ether. After a while, all of the ether is gone and I am left with a clear liquid at the bottom of the flask, which should be the pure azide. The azide has a melting point that is very close to room temperature so I put it in the freezer overnight. When I come back the next day, it has all become a white solid. Now I let it come to room temperature and it stays as a solid. Now that I have the tosyl azide, I can start with the click chemistry. So to the flask with the azide, I add 10 ml of acetonitrile. I shake it around and the solid dissolves easily. Now I set the flask on a scale and dropwise add around 1.18 grams of ethanyl benzene. Afterward, I add 50 mg of 2-aminophenol. Then I clamp the flask down and start stirring. Now to start the reaction, I add 200 mg of copper 2 acetate monohydrate. I simply stopper the flask and leave it to stir for a few hours. We can see the reaction mixture quickly starts changing color. In this click reaction, we are coupling tosyl azide and ethanyl benzene. The copper 2 acetate monohydrate is the catalyst and 2 aminophenol is the reducing agent. The 2 aminophenol will convert the copper 2 plus to copper 1 plus which will catalyze the reaction. And when I come back, the mixture is a nasty brown green and the reaction should be finished. To know if the reaction is finished, I took a TLC of the mixture. If it is finished, all of the azide should be consumed and not show up on the TLC. On the left, we can see the TLC of the pure azide and on the right of the reaction mixture. As we can see, the spots from the azide is no longer seen in the reaction mixture. So it has all been consumed and the reaction is finished. Now to remove most of the catalyst, I dilute the reaction mixture with a 25% ammonium chloride solution. I then add about 30 ml of DCM to extract the product. I then move the mixture to a separatory funnel and dilute the upper water layer with some more water. I then shake it and drain away the lower DCM layer. I then extract the remaining water layer with some more DCM and combine the extracts. Then I put the DCM extracts back into the sap funnel and wash it with some water. Then I take the DCM layer and dry it with some anhydrous sodium sulfate. I filter the mixture through some cotton and sea light and it becomes a lot more clear. Now I set the filter up for a short path vacuum distillation to remove all of the DCM. After no more DCM seems to come over, I stop the distillation and I am left with a brown red liquid that contains some solid. Now to purify the product, I will do column chromatography. So I set up a column 
and add in a slurry of spherical silica gel in 5% ethyl acetate in hexanes. I wait for all of the silica gel to pack and then add a layer of sand on top. Now I wait for the liquid to reach the top of the sand. When that happens, I add in the product that I mix with some 5% ethyl acetate in hexanes. Unfortunately, a lot of solid is present and sticks to the side of the column. The problem that is faced here is that the product isn't very soluble in the element, so it will require a huge amount of solvent to get it through. Unfortunately, this wasn't mentioned in any of the literature that I read, even though they all use the same element. Such handy details often don't make it into papers or their supporting information, which is bad for reproducibility. I'm just gonna run it anyway and hope that some pure product can be recovered. I run the product into the silica and then add more eluent on top. After hours upon hours of columning and liters of collected eluent, I stop the column. In the meantime, I already started vacuum distilling over the liters of solvent. During the distillation, we can see its pore solubility with our own eyes. Even with hundreds of mils of solvent remaining, the product already precipitates as a white solid. After boiling off all of the solvent, the flask is coated in a white fluffy solid. But because the column ran for so long, some yellow impurity also came through. Now to take out the product, I add some acetone to dissolve it and pour it all into a crystallizing dish. I wash it with some more acetone and then start heating the dish to evaporate it all off. Now, since there was a yellow impurity, I moved it all into a smaller flask afterward and washed it with 5% ethyl acetate in hexanes. Since we know the product is poorly soluble in this mixture, we can use it to get rid of the impurity. After stirring it for a while, we can see a white solid at the bottom and the solvent has become yellow. To get it out, I set it up for a vacuum filtration. I place the filter paper on top of the glass filter and filter it all through. I wash the flask a few times with 5% ethyl acetate and hexanes to get out all of the solid and to wash away the dirty solvent containing the impurity. When that is done, I let the solid dry on the filter for a few minutes and break up some of the larger crumbles. Afterward, I scraped all of the solid off the filter and I am left with 0.64 grams of product. This corresponds to a yield of 20%, which is a lot lower than the high yields in literature. This isn't too surprising since I stopped the column prematurely because I was taking a lot of time to get through. We did see total consumption of the azide on the TLC, which tells us that at least everything had reacted. The reaction is of course still very simple and should work very well. It is just this specific product that is very annoying to column. Anyhow, this was the Nobel Prize winning click chemistry in action. We see that it is a relatively simple way of building large molecules. Let me know if you think that click chemistry deserved a Nobel Prize. And with that, I would like to thank you for watching, and as always, a special thanks to all my patrons. See ya!